Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome to the second episode of Futurism Forever podcast. Um, tonight, we're going to be talking about the manifesto of futurism. Um, my panel includes Zoltanis HN and Scythian Warrior. And uh, yeah, I guess we'll do a little background on like what futurism is and um, what the manifesto is and what uh, they hope to accomplish with it. Um, so futurism mm -hmm. was an Italian avant-garde art movement um, that emerged in the uh, early 20th century in Italy. Um, the manifesto was published in 1909 in Le Figaro newspaper in France. And uh, yeah, it, it uh, was all about uh, throwing away the past and embracing the future, embracing new technologies like automobiles and airplanes, um, glorifying war. It was very illiberal, very nationalist, but at the same time being very anarchistic. And um, yeah, does anyone have anything to add for like a brief overview on what futurism is? Uh, not pretty brief introduction. We could go more into it a bit later. Yeah, it's just really off the cuff. Like, I don't have a script prepared or anything. So. It's like radical progressive accelerationism. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You can say that. I mean, it's a form of accelerationism, I guess. Just applied on a state level. Yeah, with technology and the economics, but yeah. Yep. Okay. So we're going to go over the 11 points and kind of uh, have a little discussion uh, after each point. So like, yeah, we'll just go through point for point. So point one of the manifesto of futurism, we want to sing the love of danger, the habit of energy and rashness. Um, does anyone have anything they want to say on that? Um. I think that sums up the whole basis of futurism, really. But boldness, living dangerously, energy, which has to do with their glorification of speed and technology, rashness, which is their harsh militarism and individualism. So it sums it up all quite well. It kind of shows it off its Nietzschean roots, which plays into fascism as a whole. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Could probably bring up one of the uh, quotes that Mussolini would use at the black shirts. Uh, I think it's in the boldness essay. The dagger in her teeth and the bomb in her hands. <laughs> and an infinite scorn in our hearts. Yep. Yeah, it's um like the Arditi uh, World War One trench runners. Their motto was "Mena Frego," which means uh, "I don't care." Um, so yeah, it was like it's very. Um, about that like um it was like a we laugh at danger kind of thing which also goes back to nietzsche and uh the need to live dangerously take risks um live life to the fullest you know it's like our boy keller yeah yeah for sure um <laughs> Yeah, like the uh, our last podcast we talked about the constitution of fume guido keller was um a world war one uh, our DD soldier, I believe. Um, he flew airplanes and shit too. So, yeah. Um, and yeah, he took part in this seizure of Fiume and uh, the occupation of Fiume. Um, he was also, besides being fond of futurist art, he also frequented male and female orgies. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he, he was a nudist <laughs> and he was into yoga and. Uh, he was an interesting guy. People Did should he look protest the Catholic Church by like dropping like a bouquet or something from a plane. Yeah, uh, I think he dropped a bouquet on the Italian Parliament. <laughs> uh, I think he dropped he dropped shit on uh, the Parliament too. So <laughs> that was his uh, choice of social protest. Yeah. Yeah, he was an interesting guy. He was like a contemporary of uh, Denunzio, and um, he did go on to become a uh, a fascist. Uh, I think he died before World War II started, but um, I'd have to like double check the facts on that, though. I don't want to say things that aren't true. Just kind of going off, running off my memory right now. But yeah, um, Guido Keller definitely embodies point one. 
for sure. Um, shall we move on to point two? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so two, the essential elements of our poetry will be courage, audacity, and revolt. Uh, to me, that just seems more like an actualization of what they want to do with the individual. So he has to embody uh, the type of values that they're putting forth, which is like boldness, militarism. And that's kind of expressed in its art form, too, not just its poetry, which is a uh, if, you, if you look at futurist art, a lot of it is basically just complete and utter chaos, technology, explosions, people fighting and killing each other. They wanted to uh, represent. I think it's called like representative art. Yeah, it's representative of the symbolism of what they're saying, what they what they stand for. They wanted yeah, to yeah. convey like uh, speed and motion on the on the uh, canvas. So like that's why it's like often blurry and um, like there are no like real clear figures. Um, it's supposed to convey like movement and motion and it's in keeping with uh, the preoccupation with speed. Yeah, definitely. Uh, but also, all these points tie into each other. So you know, poetry futures was an art movement, and they they loved poetry above all things. Like they like Marinetti was known first and foremost as a poet. So very big deal when they talk about poetry, since it also goes into one of the later points of of war being a, a like a form of modern art. So it's essentially a type of poetry. Which plays into their militarism but not just that it's like the uh the poetry itself would also carry on like into the fascist movement with like gentile when he wrote the the basic concepts of like uh actualism which is his essay explaining its basic principles he talks about the poetry and that and how it actually not just it embodies what futurism is putting forward but it, it kind of connects the italian people to the past its mi militaristic spirit it kind of binds them to the will of the people who died on the battlefield in the first place. Yeah, so there's that. So yeah, poetry, very big deal in futurism. Yeah, uh, for courage, sure. Courage, audacity, especially the revolt, the last part is very important. It's the entire point of futurism is to revolt against the status quo, to tear it down, to enforce their own vision of a society onto the Italian people, to liberate them from the weight of their past as marinetti would put it yeah for sure like futurism was a uh, was a style that was applied to all types of art forms um like it wasn't just about painting or just about poetry there's futurist music there's futurist cinema they even tried to recreate like cuisine fashion ballet like everything they wanted to create a completely new way of life um yeah, no, Marinetti has spoke against Possus and he thought since he thought it was lethargic. Yeah. So like I do know like uh like when Mussolini like assimilated the movement, he kinda toned down some of the stuff, but during the so the uh, social republic, a lot of the concepts that were used under futurism were actually revived. <clears throat> you could you could even go through like uh Giovinesa, the anthem they used for the S social republic. They uh, completely revised the lyrics and a lot of the stuff that was added in there uh, had a lot of kind of like futurist calling cards and the lyricism. I was not aware of that. That is interesting, though. But yeah, it I'll talks about, it. It, well, the, the lyrics are shifted over to where it just sounds like uh, where they're fighting to like the last man. So it's kind of trying to embody uh, what's going on with the war. They're, they're going to fight to like the last stand. Yeah, for sure. Uh, should we move on to point three? Yes. Okay. Uh, point three: literature. Literature has up to now magnified pensive immobility, ecstasy, and slumber. We want to exalt movements of aggression, feverish sleeplessness, the double march, the perilous leap, the slap and the blow with the fist. Ah, uh, yes. So. Literature is up to now magnified pensive immobility. Um, I've seen slumber. This is again about rejection of the past, which they viewed as well everything you just said. They thought it wasn't it wasn't dynamic. It was archaic at that point. So they wanted to like remove it since they thought it was detrimental to the nation as a whole. Since what use is something that doesn't have dynamism that doesn't give a 
a population or a people spirit like what's the point of it is how they saw of it so again very um very revolutionary very progressive goes against the whole narrative that fascism was a conservative movement which it wasn't they incorporated futurism for a reason since it played into the state's goals of wanting to reform the nation state well just the nation i mean and the state too but um again very you have very individualistic connotations as with a lot of these a lot of their poetry but this is merged into a cult of war which is collectivist by its nature yeah I this can, point uh, is uh, very action orientated um like the slap and the blow with the fist um like it implies yeah action and violence um it kind of ma- it kind of makes me think of the movie that was made to be like anti-fascist the uh, solo uh, like Sailor. Sodom yeah, yeah much, much, of the, of Sodom. much of the aesthetics and the stuff that's going on in that movie it's basically the straight up torture <laughs> yeah no they had futurist paintings at the end if, we, uh, if i don't know if you've seen the movie but at the end the two soldiers are dancing all those paintings behind them are futurist talent futurists i see a painting from mayakovsky up on there they call themselves the true anarchists too which kind of fits with a lot of the stuff that's going on with futurism or yeah, its relation only- with fascism it- the only yeah. true anarchism is the anarchism of power, is the quote yeah. that's in the movie. Yeah, we fascists are only true anarchists. Bodies, especially the early fascist aesthetic before, like before nineteen nineteen, when the party split, really, like more liberty, much more emphasis on freedom, really. Uh, as we saw with Fiume, it was the libertine sex haven, essentially. Um, this wasn't really ever fully rejected, even under even under like at the actual PNF regime, since you still had elements of futurism implemented, and a cult of war itself applies a certain level of freedom, since war is, by their doctrine, is a emanci- emancipating act. So the true freedom is in war. So it still has a very freedom, a freedom-seeking aesthetic, a very action-oriented, a egoistic oriented aesthetic which passes on into fascism and the service of the state well like the the actual like fascist philosophy too with like actualism I, i've kind of talked about this before but like a lot of the people is like uh it's not like a correct criticism but a lot of the criticism was directed at gentile is that his philosophy was just sophism and they I, I i personally take that interpretation of it but like the actual pure look of the ideologies when it says perception creates the group and the group it becomes the manifestation of a collective will of its own consciousness that's that's effectively saying that the state is an ego of its own that embodies every person you are the state the state is you that everybody is the state that is the state and the, the deuce is supposed to be the manifestation of your own will it's actually very egoist or sternite yeah, so when you still have to falls think about into it egoism yep yeah, yeah, so it's, it's, it's even going, in, um, all of it comes back to egoism. Even in um, Origin and Doctrine of Fascism, Gentile talks about war as like a uniting factor that could like help mold uh, the Italian people into uh, that entity that you talked about of being like one with the state. Like only war could do that. Um, it couldn't be done through like peaceful means. So. Like the uh, the glorification of war, yeah, definitely carried over into the fascist era. Uh, I think we'd go over the next point now. But yeah. Okay, sounds good. Uh, four, we declare that the splendor of the world has been enriched by a new beauty, the beauty of speed. A racing automobile with its bonnet adorned with great tubes like serpents with explosive breath. A roaring motor car which seems to run on machine gun fire is more beautiful than the victory of Samoth race. Um, yeah, so this is their emphasis on technology of the automobile, of industry, of machinery. It plays into how they want to merge man and machine to create a new, stronger man. Like, for example, the Farka the Futurist, I'm pretty sure it's about like their man is like merged with machinery quite literally. So it's a stronger man who has the dynamism of the machinery and the egoism of man to basically enforce his will onto others. So, we, yeah, for sure. So it plays into, you know, 
worship of technology, worshiping war, worshiping violence, worshiping destruction. Um, and on that point of worshiping destruction, uh, I don't know if, if this could be on YouTube. I don't think I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to edge into saying this, but I, I remember reading an article where it was basically paralleling the futurism and its aesthetic to ISIS. <laughs> I've I've seen a book on Amazon about that, like uh, ISIS and futurist aesthetics or something. Um, yeah, I actually read the article. Um, I think it's correct in pointing out the aesthetics of ISIS are pretty aligned with futurism in many ways. But I don't. I really just think it's an aesthetic since futurism is anti-clerical, and ISIS is like they're Wahhabist radicals. Yeah. But, there is a shared aesthetic since it's a civil war. They're going to glorify like all these destructive acts. And you also, and they, they also like pillage these pagan sites in like Babylonia. Like they destroyed the entire city of Nimrod, which the futurists would love. It kind of makes me think of like a lot of the, a lot of the siege culture guys kind of like on a related note. Cause a lot of them are kind of into like on one of the telegram channels on here, I, I said it's, kind of like glows but they said like we support any form of terrorism <laughs> and they, they want to tear down like all historic historicism related to the modern <laughs> era yeah no I, I guess that could be paralleled back to futurism but futurism would be exalting in the modern era if anything yeah in Maybe a way it's not... like its own form of postmodernism. if you actually think about it long enough yeah since it mainly like it, it rejects like the liberal developments which modernism brought but it fully embraces its technological elements as being inherently anti-liberal so they merge it with like very masochist very sadistic very uh, kind of macho ideas of the individual to like combat liberalism instead of you know the soft liberalism of which it produced But yeah, that's a coda. The futurist aesthetic did, does play into ISIS, I guess. It does play into siege as a whole. Like This is one of the things I was thinking when I first got into futurism, that it's very close to accelerationism, that it wants to destroy everything, it wants to basically create something new. Because a lot of like the actual accelerationists, uh, they're not like traditionalists, they're not evolatards. Like, a lot of them are, like, weird, either o 9 or they're just, uh, or a lot of them are even self-described futurists, so there's that. They have their interpretation of futurism, which yeah. is, like, the, the American Futurist Manifesto from Iron March. Maybe we'll cover that at some point, too, but, um... The problem with them, though, themselves, even when it comes to their futurism, is it has too many traditionalist aspects actually assimilated into it. It's a bit of a contradiction of itself. They just do it because yeah. of the aesthetic. They like what Marinetti said, so they're going to change yeah. it because it fits them with accelerationism. It's not yeah. actual futurism. They're just doing it because they want I, to... I know you can find a lot of aspects related to futurism, too, and kind of Nick Land's, like, philosophy of accelerationism or modern uh, capitalism that's trying to create like these uh, small like city states or like revival like a feudal system using capitalism as a means for that and he's very technologically uh, driven in a lot of those views yeah there's parallels like there's parallels overall with futurism and any type of accelerationism I mean yeah, we should go on to the next point yep sounds good uh, so point five we want to sing the man at the wheel, the ideal axis of which crosses the Earth, itself hurled along its orbit. Um. So yeah, it talks about seeing the man at the wheel. Very, again, plays into the individualism and egoism we've mentioned before. Um, essentially, man takes his own de destiny, carves his own path, takes the helm as takes the helm essentially. Not not like following any dogma, as Nietzsche would put out, following religious dogma, doing as he pleases. Essentially, the catchphrase is mina frego. They don't care. Yeah, this one, this one point kind of alludes to like air travel too. Like, uh, there's a there's an entire subgenre of futurist art called like aeronautica that's like glorifies the airplane specifically. 
Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Tulio Crowley is like one of the uh, big painters in that style who kind of came into the scene a little late, but he has some of like the most famous paintings in that style. Um, you know, people can Google image that and uh, see examples of his work. But right, yeah, anything else we want to say for part five? We can move uh, on. No, I'm good. All right. All right. Point six. Point six. Uh, the poet must spend himself with warmth, glamour, and prodigality to increase the enthusiastic fervor of the primordial elements. The poet. So, I'm actually, hmm, I don't know how to sound what to say about this point, to be honest. What do you think? Uh, the, the, primary, the, the primordial elements, I think it's kind of like relating it to like human instinct on a primal level. So they're trying to act on the instinct. Oh, yeah. So, like, part the of human, human instinct, instinct is actually progressing and modernizing. Yeah, human instinct to be aggressive and accelerate. Yeah. I think that's what it's saying. The poet yeah. should, like, the artist should, uh, you know, completely encompass his artwork. The two should be one and the same. Um, I think it's kind of a yeah. They should be they should manifest the uh, the violent the violent actions and the spirit of it. Yeah, it plays into militarism too. Since remember, an artist and poet is also a soldier for the futurists. So the soldier submerges and emerges like uh, he uh, what's it called? He uh, merges himself with the with the what's it called? With his desire of war, merges himself completely in it. That kind of bleeds into uh, point seven, so I think I'll just like yeah. jump ahead to that. I do think uh, it would be interesting to bring up really fast before you do that that most of the futurists actually went to war and a lot of them died in World War One. So yeah, Marinetti fought in World it. War One. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, they they talked about it and then they like actually did it. Like they put their thought to action. They weren't just ideologues or you know, criticizing from the from the sidelines, like they actively took part in, they glorified war and then they actually went to war and backed uh, their ideas up. Well, one of the things the I can think of is like, uh, kind of like for a modern reference, like Traditionalist Workers Party, which was like the Tradfag uh, neo-Nazi party. Heimbach yeah. uh, believed in like compulsory military service for everybody for at least four years, but he himself never did military service. Like, uh, you know, I believe in compulsory military service. I actually went into the military. So I guess that's like a big difference. Like the futurists actually did what they were saying. So they were actually in line with their own thoughts. Yeah, for sure. Like it was, uh, it wasn't just an act to them. Like they were their art. Um, you know, they made art out of their own life and uh, that lived up it. to it. It wasn't an act. That puts it completely in line with fascist thought, too, which glorifies and exalts action for the sake of action, and it brings the theoretical implications with its action. Yeah, for sure. So, point seven. Beauty exists only in struggle. There is no masterpiece that is not an aggressive character. Poetry must be a violent assault on the forces of the unknown to force them to bow before man. It's very uh, Nietzschean right there. Yeah, that kind of that's perfectly in line with not just fascist thought, but even national socialist thought, where it's only about act, action, going through struggle. Life is struggle, and you see that in a lot of the art because all the art is warfare. The poetry is has a lot of uh, militarism with it, and uh, even even with like the architecture in relation to some of the the buildings or even the monuments that were actually built during the fascist era, which uh, glorified the imperial spirit of Rome. Also glorified the male aesthetic, so you got intense homoeroticism for the purpose of warfare. Which the futurists, we can, talking about them in homoeroticism can be a complete, an another total discussion, because there's a ton to cover for that. But yeah, generally glorifying the male physique, because they, it's, it's masculinity, they, they worship masculinity. They worship youth, especially masculinity and youth are the core parts of their of their ideology. Because su if you're going to sum up futurism in three words, it's speed, you or four speed, youth, violence, and masculinity. 
I can actually think of the quote from the rise and fall of the third Reich where the Mussolini is captured and he's actually eating food with uh, some of the partisans that captured him. And they were just kind of asking him questions about what he thinks about them. And he said, youth, I love youth, even when they bear the things at me, which kind of shows his character in a lot of ways. And now it's in line with that, too. Yes, the beauty exists only in struggle. There's no masterpiece that is not an aggressive character. It reminds me of, it kind of reminds me of Iron March, to be honest, because they talk about how, you know, there's the struggle, the, the natural truth. You need to achieve it through the struggle, that it's a beautiful oh, thing. Nietzschean so. philosophy, just in its yeah, actual it's Nietzschean. meaning. It's very Nietzschean. Like Nietzsche said, struggle and suffering are objectively and in, well maybe not objectively but like they're good they're inherently good which is his point so they say beauty exists only in struggle it's an exaltation of struggling and life of suffering because it breaks you down and kind of improves upon you physically and mentally so poetry must be advanced on the forces of the unknown to the force and the bow before man again very nietzschean also, you could kind of perceive this. You could perceive this as an exaltation of a state, since violence, assault, and unknown to force and to bow before men implies a sovereignty to force something to bow before men. You could put put that into the statist perspective, with this, especially with fascism and its state. Well, I, I could, could I could even think about it in terms of the new man too, because he's bowing. Yeah, he's he's bending yeah. like the material conditions to his own will. Yeah, so you or you could like or I was gonna say you could probably take as an individual anarchist or egoistic perspective of you force everything to bow before you, you don't bow before anyone else. Kinda so get, like, it, it's kinda got the might makes right mentality going with it. Yeah, too. no futurism is about might makes right at the end of the day. I would describe might makes right as kind of egoist too though. It Not is. necessarily anarchist, but Yeah, no, like uh, it's not necessarily up. is like violence isn't inherently anarchist. It's like it's not inherently with any ideology, but it's only, I guess you could say it's only inherent to, to futurism itself, really, because it's. I really wouldn't describe it as like a pure ideology on itself. It's why you have communists or anarchists or fascists to call them. Yes, it's like it's more like poetic anarchism that they want to revolt against the modern state to deconstruct it, demolish the status quo. It's more poetic anarchism than literal anarchism which is why later on in the manifesto he glorifies anarchism yeah uh that's Maybe. coming up in, in point yeah, nine point nine yeah so we're on point eight yep um so point eight we are on the extreme promontory of the centuries what is the use of looking behind at the moment when we must open the mysterious shutters of the impossible time and space died yesterday we are already living in the absolute, since we have already created eternal omnipresence speed. Yeah, so this plays into speed and violence. Their worship of technology, too, since obviously technology allows us to go faster and creates more violent ways of warfare. So it plays into, you know, war fetishism. Um, we are living... We are, we are, the last mm -hmm. line, we're living in the absolute since you've created eternal omnipresent speed. I was thinking that maybe it can be parallel to some form of like philosophical absolute that Hegel talked about. Like, I'm not really too big on the philosophy, but it's like the absolute for fascism, the state. Yeah, the state is the absolute because it's a, a manifestation of the collective ego or like the consciousness. Yes. Yeah, so like this is a, this is a distinction between futurism and fascism. The state is the absolute for fascism, law for futurism. It's pure violence, pure speed. Also, total rejection of the past in point eight. Um, what is the use of looking behind at the moment when we must open the mysterious shutters of the impossible? Like they were very forward thinking, progressive. It didn't want to rely on past dogma. Exactly. To destroy it all. Like I remember talking. Remember talking to a futurist. And he made he made a good point actually about how a modern futurist would be burning the futurist manifesto. Yeah, he gets into that in the outro um, to the closing of the manifesto. Like it's a very like punk rock, live fast, die young mentality. Like um, he says when he when he turns forty, he wants uh, the futurist manifesto thrown into the waste basket waste basket of history. 
Um, what's really Destiny? weird? What's really the, weird is that uh, I, I'm pretty sure like Marinetti himself ended up just like conforming to much of the traditional aspects later on in his life. Anyway, so it kind of proves the point of futurism. Really, is he kind of became lame and retarded when he got old. Uh, he started yeah, eating pasta and uh, warmed up to Catholicism. And uh, yeah, a lot of the a lot of the futures actually incorporated like religious aestheticism as time went on because of how the PNF made peace with the Catholic Church or political move. Since the church was at odds with Italy ever since the unification, so Mussolini uh, made peace with them as kind of like a political gamble. Yeah, you can see well, that. Like, I don't, well, I don't. I don't really. So, like, when it came to like Mussolini's like ideology, anyway, it's like I, I wouldn't describe it as purely futurist, even though there's a lot of elements. But like with the actual futurists themselves, it seemed like they kind of like grew out of their own their own philosophy, which I think is kind of sad. I, I yeah, would it's, say, like, uh, it's, it's like it's like marionette yeah i just found the quote in the manifest a bit late i'm gonna one minute i'm gonna find it again uh well us among us are not yet 30 years old we're there for at least 10 years to accomplish our task we are 40 younger and stronger men men than uh than we throw us in the waste paper basket like useless manuscripts they will come against us from afar leap on the light candles to their first poems clutching the air at their predatory fingers and sniffing at the gates of the academies of the good scent of our decaying spirits they promised the catacombs of the libraries so yeah as they got older they kind of lost that spirit which marinade kind of foresaw and he didn't that when that happened he wants basically his entire thing to be rejected so the more ver so the verita so the virile youth spirit can actually thrive so he was embodying his philosophy totally because he said he wasn't pussying out and making an exception for himself of no 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 keep me around guys no he's saying no when i turn 40 literally shove us down the shove us in the basket because we're gonna be useless for you yeah, I'm not saying that uh, to keep me around. I'm just saying that it, he himself just longer conforms to it. But that, I'm not saying that's necessarily a bad thing about futurism. I would say, yeah, like, no, but he foresaw would, him not conforming it. Is my point. I would say the fascists incorporated like the aesthetics of futurism, but like not really the ideology behind it. Yeah, the, the aesthetics was incorporated, but not all of the political points were incorporated. Like, for example, the futurists wanted to phase out the family with state-owned education, separating men and women from birth, which which the fascists never did. And one of the main reasons why I think they actually did this was I was reading. Uh, I'm not too sure. I'm not sure if this is true, but I remember reading this. Uh, one of the main reasons why they didn't do it was the Catholic Church protested it because they thought that if men were raised separate from women, it would breed homosexuality amongst them, which they didn't want. I'm not too sure if that's true, but I just remember vaguely reading it. So, yeah, the, the it plays into like homoeroticism of male, like glorifying masculinity, rejecting femininity, hating on woman. Hating on woman. I yeah. hate woman. It's coming up in point nine. Um, should I, should yeah. we move on? Yeah, okay. it's moving to point nine. It's my favorite point. Yeah, me too. <laughs> We want to glorify war, the only cure for the world. Militarism, patriotism, the destructive gesture of the anarchists, the beautiful ideas which kill, and contempt for woman. Yes, yeah, so the contempt for woman in the last part. Um, I'm pretty sure in the other translations of the manifesto, that last part is replaced with something else. There are Not different true. translations. Sometimes anarchists is freedom bringers. Yeah, Sometimes or libertarians. Beautiful. Sometimes it's beautiful ideas worth dying for. The uh, my reading of it I posted earlier today like was a different translation than the one we're reading now, and it's uh, it's freedom bringers, it's uh, beautiful ideas worth dying for, and scorn for women. So yeah, so the point of how it the word changes from libertarian to freedom fighters, it kind of plays into the notion that they don't literally mean anarchism. They mean a more poetic sense of anarchy, of this total chaos of destroying the state to bring about a new social order. So it's more poetic than, than a not literal, which I think, for example, like a lot of the anarchists who try to claim futurism kind of neglect that. Yeah, there's an, like an anarchistic aesthetic, but it's more poetic and not literal the future is still demanded like a like a pretty strong state even if they wanted like even if they were pretty libertine 
and hands off in many regards, like their political platform. They wanted to like replace standing army with the militia system. I think they wanted to abolish the standing. I mean, they wanted to abolish the secret police too. So you still have a lot of those like libertarian elements in them, but it's not literal the anarchist part. More I think we could just point to like the Constitution of Fiume, really, for that because it seems like yeah, it, like the it Constitution was more of, of Fiume was about what they wanted. But yeah, they don't mean like literal anarchism. It's just more poetic. Um, want to glorify war? The only cure for the world again, militarism. They fought in the war in World War One, so they're going to be glorifying that. Well, patriotism, patriotism implies that they are statist and anarchists are yeah, not. Yeah, because, so. like, like, obviously, you know, the nation can only effectively exist with a state. Yeah, so, like, even in the point, like, it kind of contradicts itself. Yeah, which is why I say it's more poetic than literal. So, yeah, beautiful sure. ideas which kill, or what's the other translation of that? Uh, beautiful ideas worth dying for. So, like... The translation does change the meaning a lot, so it depends on which translation you I go think, by. I think, I'm uh, not sure which is closer to the original Italian. Yeah, so. I don't think it's too relevant since both both messages have a role in futurism. Beautiful ideas which kill obviously plays into the glorification of violence, of a worship around like war and death. Uh, or you could take another idea as a beautiful idea is worth dying for. That's uh you know, giving yourself up to something, which also plays into futurism, since you have something worth living for. Yep, um, for sure. Yeah, so, anyone else want to add to that? No, it seems pretty good to me. Like, uh, I don't know a whole lot about futurism myself, so it's more about you guys on this one. <laughs> All right. I think we can move ahead to point 10. Um, All right. We want to demolish museums and libraries, fight morality, feminism, and all opportunist and utilitarian cowardice. It's going to be a sex, sorry. Sounds like they're just the, partly they're going against like the status quo of art at the time in Italy, because I'm pretty sure the art of Italy at that time was actually more of like a romanticist art. Yeah, like it's romanticist. This is like where the split between Annunzio and Marinetti happened. Like, they didn't really like each other. The Nunzios are romanticist. Well, Marinetti didn't really like the romanticist movement. He wanted to, like, break off from it, which is why he's saying, you know, we have to demolish the academia. And I think he wanted, like, a new institution to house shit like this. But, uh, present demands were just burn it all. Fight morality. Feminism and all opportunities you tell in cowardice. I'm pretty sure there's also other writings of Marinetti who talks about defiling graveyards. Yeah, he says like because he said museums are. Yeah, he called he called museums essentially just like massive gravestones that littered the lands of Italy. Um, a lot of morality. them too, at that time had a lot of uh, a lot of the museums at the time in Italy kind of glorified liberal politics too. So that'd be something interesting yeah. to point out. Uh, the yeah. uh, opportunist and utilitarian cowardice kind of brings to mind like utilitarian, like utilitarianism, John Stuart Mill, Vosh. like the yeah. Vosh. Yeah, yeah, essentially Vosh. just like ne neglecting like the this like some notion of human well-being, of material comfort. It's a rejection of humanism when you actually think about it. Yeah, no, care about futurism the is just a right, right rejection of it because they don't value human they value human life but not in the same way as humanists says it's it's an inversion of humanism they value human life which is why they want to take away human life they value some human life over other human life because they think the only way to fully realize a, a life is to die for your life and to enforce your will onto others which results in the death of others but it's it's an inversion of humanism. Um, you have to be the fullest version of yourself to even live a life before you t before you like take a life or give up your life. That's that's how you die your life. It's like, like a good death, like be the, be the same. Yeah, concept. heroic death also yeah. reminds me of like Mishima a bit. I remember reading an article uh, that he wrote uh, about you can Mishima. He wrote an article on the death of James Dean. It was an American actor who he really liked. Down in a car crash, he mentioned how. 
at least he died when he was young, so he died when he was beautiful. And he brought up how brought up Alexander the Great, and he brought up Achilles because Alexander the Great loved Achilles. Basically, modeled everything he did after this mythical hero. And he mentioned how Alexander at least died when he was young. So the state of his last state was like how he was appearing in the statues, beautifully youthful, masculine, virile. He didn't have to die when his body was decaying, so there wouldn't be a there wasn't a uh, mismatch between the form which was represented in the sculptures left of him and how he actually was when he died. It even makes me think of like culture thugs views when he talked about Kadriani when Kadriani died. Uh, it was a martyr for his own political views. And for that sense, he's he had a good death. Like obviously like being executed the way he wasn't, wasn't, but like it was a good death in the sense that he was a martyr for his own beliefs. Like he died for his beliefs. He was, he stood with his beliefs. He didn't compromise them. Most people nowadays, when it comes to stuff like this, they'll compromise their beliefs immediately. And even when they die after being in the movement for a very long time, it's not really a good death because they're no longer following their actual ideology of what it was. I could think of Mason went from being like this uh, really cool guy, really heavily into accelerationism and all this stuff related to national socialism, but now he's just some retarded, a uh, Christian identity theocrat. Yeah, um, so fight morality, again, egoistic, Nietzschean, mean it for a go. They don't care about morality. They don't give a shit overall. They just want to do what they want to do. Which I think uh, this, as, as we've said, futures and played heavily into fascism. So the Chad fags are naturally going to get mad at this when they learn fascism is in hecking wholesome Marino monarcho traditionalism. Well, it's like it tried to keep a secular state, even when we looked at that's completely incompatible with like Catholic doctrine, which was trad fag. They wanted the state to be completely mixed in. Yeah, like Italy church. never even had like, for example, like even like even uh when they cooperated with the church temporarily, which the which the classic church regretted. Uh, there were like because of how they wanted to keep church and state separate for secularism, there was never anti sodomy laws in Italy. Mm -hmm. Like, they yep. never had anything... Like, the church wanted to have anti-sodomy laws, but they never implemented them. The most they did was send you to some random island where the guards fell in love with the fucking homosexuals there anyway. <laughs> we can even talk about that uh, the movie uh, Sodom or Solo. It's so Solo. Yeah, they're yeah, they're yeah. homosexuals. There's literally a scene where, one, where, like, I think the president of the commission asks one of the soldiers to sodomize him. Well, not even, like, just that itself. It, it, it's kind of reflected with, like, the actual, like, black shirts, what they would do to, like, their political enemies. Not just, like, sodomy, but, like, stuff, like, the, the way they would torture them. Like, they would make them take, I don't know what it's called exactly, but they would make them, like, well, take some make type of drug where they really shit, they would shit themselves to death and stuff like that. They made them drink castor oil, which would make them shit themselves. Yeah, like, they, they got off on it. <laughs> Yeah, no, the black shirts weren't moral. It reminds me of the NSDAP. Uh, I remember reading a excerpt from Inside the Third Reich, that that one book. Uh, let me read the extra. Give me a sec. Let me find it. But I know the national NSDAP wasn't uh, fascist, but kind of plays into it. So one minute, I'm trying to find it. I would like to say that, like, Salo isn't meant to be, like, an accurate depiction of what Italian yeah. fascism was. Yeah, it's, it's anti-fascist, anti it's anti -fascist, but the core of what it says is, like, especially with the line, we fascists and the true anarchists, it, it's true, and Salo really loses its meaning very quickly, either if, one, you jack off to it, or two, you don't care about anything that goes on in there. It loses its meaning really quickly. Like yeah. by my third watching of it, like I, I, I literally, I, I literally got positive, positive connotations in the movie. Well, I kind of liked what they were doing to to the people in the movie. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's that. It's just just pure brutality. Yeah, brutality, like brutality itself. Like it, it can be, it can be disgusting if you look at it with like a. A moral sentiment but if you take away the moral sentiment you just look at it as gains of like your own political ideology it actually looks very or not beautiful. even it's not no it's not even politics like, a, or, uh, like for example talking about Salo, i argue it's not even political besides through the meaning which the uh, which the director pasolini wants to put onto it and the you can aesthetic. invert the political of it by just looking at the aesthetics 
Yeah, but like I'm my, my point is that I don't really consider it political since it, the the fascism it's just an aesthetic. It's just what the off what the director wanted to push onto the movie. Mm -hmm. Like take like it's not relevant. Like communists did the same thing. Beria would take sixteen year old women and rape them. Like it's the but, same shit. Oh, in Romania, they would take like uh, shit, like feces, and they would make Christians make crosses out of it. Oh and, like, yeah, the uh, shit. P P P S D, right? Yeah. Testy. Yeah. Yep. So the communists did the same thing. Um, it's not about politics. It's just about pure expression of force, which is, which fundamentally, which is more fundamental than politics. Since if you boil it down, you have po you have a pol you have politics because you exert your you exert these values which you you align with well, for whatever reason you collectivize with a political ideology to exert these values onto others. So it, it's just a will to power of exerting yourself onto another person onto another collective, whatever it may be. So I think fundamentally the movie isn't political. It's just Nietzschean. It's pure raw will to power. Might makes right. It was uh, it was written by uh, the story was written by Marquis de Sade and it yeah, was about so it. the original it's story new. like it's based off his book also with the name One Twenty Days of Sodom. They changed it around because One Twenty Days of Sodom by de Sade was in France, while this was in Italy in Salo. But yeah, the it's, overall it's, premise is the same, I think. The setting is fascist Italy because it's made for an Italian audience and it's an authoritarianism. Plus, wasn't it made recognized. during the years of lead? Yeah, the, the years of lead were just starting. I think it came out in like 70 or 71. Yeah, so you have the years of lead, so Pasolini would want to push for a anti-fascist rhetoric because he was a communist. Yeah. I love, I, even though he was a communist, I really like Pasolini, though. Good director. Great director. He also made uh, uh, the Gospel According to Saint Matthew, which is yeah. Like I wanted to watch that a few days ago, but I, I missed my chance because being a lazy. I need to watch that one day. Yeah, to be honest, Salo is not like the movie I would recommend as your first film of his to watch. His early <laughs> no, Sal Salo was my first it. film by Pasolini. When I first saw it, I didn't even know about Pasolini. I've heard about the movies another because I heard about 120 Days of Sodom, the book first, and then I saw there was a movie about it, and I wanted to watch it ever since then. My friend gave me the file, and that's why I watched it. Like I didn't even know who the director was until I actually learned about Pasolini. Yeah, it was my first Pasolini film too. I kind of wish I started with his earlier, like neo-realist films first, because they're more enjoyable. Um, <laughs> I like I like Salo in certain respects, but it, I wouldn't describe it as like an enjoyable movie to watch. Mm -hmm. It's kind of an ordeal that you get through. Uh, I it's enjoyed worth, watching worth it. If I'm gonna be honest. <laughs> Uh, to, to each their own. To each their own. It, it is worth watching. Um, it's worth watching at least movie. once, especially if you're like into futures yeah. or fascism. You can watch it since even though it's anti-fascist, if you remove all moral, if you, if you just don't view the movie from a moral standpoint, you don't really get an anti-fascist standpoint. You just get a pure expression of power, which is inherent to fascism. Yeah, and, for enough, sure. enough Sela. I think we should move on to the last point. Yeah, for sure. I was going to say the same. So, point 11. We will sing of the great crowds agitated by work, pleasure, and revolt. The multicolored and polyphonic surf of revolutions in modern capitals. The nocturnal vibration of the arsenals and the workshops beneath their violent electric moons. The gluttonous railway stations devouring smoking serpents. Factories suspended from the clouds by the threat of their smoke. Bridges with the leap of gymnasts flung across the diabolic cutlery of sunny rivers. Adventurous steamers sniffing the horizon. Gray-breasted locomotives puffing on the rails like enormous steel horses with long tubes for bridle. And the gliding flight of aeroplanes whose propeller sounds like the flapping of a flag. And the applause of enthusiastic crowds. It's a very poetic... Um, um patriotic future yeah, so let's, uh, let's let's break this down um mm -hmm. you know, seeing of the great cows actually by work pleasure and revolt so, so, so yeah, it's, very another, yeah, it's like, poetic yeah. so you have to break it down yeah so i think it's talking about how they're gonna like exalt labor 
the vault like pleasure hedonism and revolution so they say how like you have the masses of people who are agitated or in this case they're brought to action by work their labor by their personal pleasures and their like revolutionary spirit so they're going to assault that that like chaotic environment yep. um a multicolored and polyphonic surf of revolutions in modern capitals yeah so it plays into what i said before just about glorifying the revolutionaries in the cities specifically in the cities mind you they weren't the futurists weren't agrarianists they they exalted the urbanites so you have like you'll have a you have his urbanism coming over you when he singles out the modern capitals of uh, emphasis on modern um the nocturnal vibration of the arsenals and workshops beneath their violent electric moons so he talks about you know their weaponry i guess and like the factories which they produced i i think so like turn up vibration anyone else want to add it the, kind of makes me think of like what they were trying to do in italy and in, in anyways under italy he was trying Mussolini was trying to modernize the country and move it out of the agrarian lifestyle so that's probably one of the reasons why a lot of the futurists flocked to the party and they were pushing heavy for the industrialization of italy yeah, um, so the glutinous railway stations devouring smoking serpents. So yes, uh, as as we said, trying to modernize the railroad, which is a pinnacle of modernism. The fast train, the car, as they exalted before. So just building industry, building mm -hmm. infrastructure to bring Italy into the modern era. You know, destroying the horse carriage, bringing in the steam engine, stuff like that. Factories suspended from the clouds by the threat of their smoke. Bridges with the leaf of ginettes from across the diabolic cutlery of sunny rivers. Venturous steamers sniffing the horizon. Great breasts of locomotives puffing on their rails like enormous steel horses with long tubes for bridle. The gliding flight of airplanes to propel it sounds like the flopping of flying that applause and fiasco crowds. So yeah, it's about the individual like tools which play into modernization. The car. It's a symbol of, of, ind of the individual being able to go where he wants at a quick pace, not being constrained by his, by his situation. Because if you have a car, you could go from an agrarian setting to an urban setting fairly quickly. If you have a train, this connects the country. It plays into the nationalism of connecting the people together. It also plays into the modernization because having a lot of railroads is really useful for economic development and thus uh, – pulling Italy up from its from the weight of its past of being bullied by foreign powers for so long of having its wealth expropriated on the factory is that self evident you know factories are they produce produce goods which are needed for the economy for war so they produce ammunition shit like that so yeah it's overall just the last point is the culmination of all that's been talked about in the other points and they just flesh it out a bit more in a poetic sense and they just go on full tech worship yeah for sure there's um the great breasted locomotives is kind of like um merging man with machine um a little i know it's just metaphor but like i don't know some of these metaphors kind of like allude to that a little bit like yeah, like Mafarka, as I said, Mafarka the Futurist, it's really a man imbued and, and like combined with machine. So there's a level of that in that sure in there too. Very body horror, like Cronenberg or something. Yeah, just like wanting to expand on the human body, make it stronger, make it better. But I do think there is a difference. Like, I guess it's a form of transhumanism in that way, but. It doesn't want to destroy humanity, so it's not post-humanism. It... I think it sounds closer to technocracy if you actually think about it. There's a lot of the um, economics certain, that they had. In certain was... regards, too, and like when you look into the men's of the of the futurist political party, which, are, which is short-lived, for getting a incorporated into the fascist party, they wanted like a futurist a youth council where anyone under thirty would be in it, and it's basically in, like serve as the state legislator. And obviously, the futurists, exalted technology, would be big on science and scientific advancement. 
So yeah, there is technocratic. There is technocratic the economics, elements. The economics that were put forward by a lot of the futurists too was syndicalist. Uh, like yeah, syndicalist and Georgism. Like I can think of like in America, the American technocracy movement uh, were actually endorsers of the futurists. Uh, like in, in Italy. Yeah, but the futurists wouldn't really like the technocracy movement since the technocracy movement were like weird internationalists. Like they wanted to like some have of some them were. A lot of them were because their plan was to have like a super state in each continent, which yeah, would, technic. Like, yeah, the technates, which kind of goes against in, uh, the nationalism. In the, the case futures. of like America, like a lot of them were like that, but he also had a large faction in the party that were in support of like uh, Dudley Pelly and Coughlin when they were involved in politics. That's because no, they wanted to use the technet to create like an American empire. Interesting. Um, but I do think there is a fine line between the technocrat movement and the futurists. Is main the main thing for the technocrats is just pure. Just like a cult of pure reason, really, of you know, using the scientific method to rationally plan your state. Well, the futurists are the complete opposite of that. They didn't care about reason or logic. They were bold. They were dynamic. They were irrational. Mm -hmm. It's the complete opposite. And the futurists glorified the soldier more than the scientist. They'd probably have a lot of these like nerdy type scientists shot, probably. Uh, yeah, quite a bit of them probably would. I do know, like, in America, the American technocracy movement only wanted people who were involved with, like, a direct occupation or in the military to even have a say in anything. Oh, interesting. So, I guess there's a form of corporatism there, which the futurists were supportive of. But, yeah, I know generally futurism emphasizes the poet, the soldier, more than, like, the scientist. Mm -hmm. Like, they, they care about scientific advancement. Artistic because it, soldiers. <laughs> yeah, like... They, yeah, exactly. It reminds me of SS warrior poet Kurt Eggers. They support yep. something like that. A warrior poet. Um, Marin Marinetti himself was a warrior poet and a nunzio. Um, yeah, nunzio was a warrior poet. Marinetti was a warrior poet. Uh, I remember them saying that say, Kurt Eggers was like a Kurt ladies' man, too. Just like a lot of the futurists. <laughs> they could get girls really easy if they wanted to. <laughs> yeah, some but the futurists hated five. a woman. Yeah, they hated the concept of feminism. Yeah, we, we should talk well, about. Well, they hated the cause of feminism, but they were like agreeing to their demands of universal suffrage. Mm -hmm. Well, it's because the cause of feminism wanted to like. If you actually think about it, most it's like there's like two different types of feminism. Like the feminism that was involved with the fascist movement, or like the National Socialist, it wasn't about uh, destroying masculinity. It was just more about bringing women into the modernizational process and giving them the same rights. But yeah. like in the, the case of like. Feminism, as we think about it within the Marxist or liberal context, is especially modern feminism. Uh, the fundamental basis of it is to abolish masculinity and femininity entirely. Yeah. And that's not but something the, the futurists would support, is that they were a cult of masculinity in a lot of ways. Yeah, and a lot of them, especially a lot of them, also supported like harsh, harsh homoeroticism. And the entire aesthetic of fascism being homoerotic would require. An existence of a masculine element. So this is something that fascism and futurism both are contrary to this feminism. But yeah, I know they agreed with the demands of you know universal suffrage. They still hated a woman. But Baron Baronetti got married. I'm pretty sure. Uh, yeah. There were there were female futurists too though, like Valentine the same. Yeah, point. I'm pretty sure uh, he actually praised her by saying she's the only person that understood futurism because she like turned futurism in on itself and kind of made it into like a nihilistic death cult to my understanding we should we should do an episode just on her um in the I haven't future read too much into her i've read her futurist manifesto on lust which i think is really good but those are the two i've read too um I've read it. I, I skimmed through her manifesto <laughs> on woman but i actually fully read the manifesto of lust I've read them both. Um, I think she, I think she deserves her own episode at some point. I don't want to mm -hmm. read too much into her. Yeah, tonight. no, she's important. There's a lot of interesting wolf female futurists, but there is like an illogical crisis of these female futurists coming in when the manifesto says hate woman. Yeah, um, it, it is like often described as a misogynist movement, um, and yeah, homoerotic. That's fair. Um, they do definitely glorify like 
masculinity, um, the warrior, um, and like masculine symbols. I would be, I would be fair though. Like feminists call anything misogynist that's critical of like their yeah. autism, anyways. <laughs> yeah, true. Yeah, but like, there's some basis with the considering Marinetti advocated for scorn or contempt towards a woman, and he hated femininity overall. Like, for example, in Mafarka the Futurist, the whole thing is that it's a ultra-masculine society where women are essentially gone. Like, there's no need for them besides for some basic reproduction. But even then, like, he talks about how the male are be able to reproduce in, in the society of Mafarka the Futurist. So the only purpose for sex for sexuality there is well there's like a there's an odd there's like a crisis for sexuality. As Marinetti himself actually was kind of like he went back and forth on homosexuality like but Farka the Futurism Farka the Futurist it there's male homosexuality is prescribed it's banned but intense male homoeroticism and homosexuality is glorified. There's a line between that, but then in a then in a work and in, in, in futurism and anthropology, there's like a speech he gave where he glorified a group of athletes for being homosexuals. So, kind of, you know, goes in on itself with masculinity. I, I think so it's high. safe to say overall futurism could be described as very masculine um, and about like symbolizing strength and. Uh, yeah, it's not well, a, it's not an ideology for like feminine. For the feminine. I would, yeah, whether it's misogynist or not, I wouldn't describe it as like feminine and gentle. Um, it's not. It's not what he was going for at all. Even like the female futurists were not really like that. So I remember man, there's a quote from Marinetti where he's like, "If I were a communist, I'd be worried of the coming war between the home between the." homosexuals and lesbians who unite against common men normal men yeah so, where is that quote from i saw that I, I don't know like i can't find the citation i haven't looked for the citation but it does sound like something marinetti would write yeah it does he, um james posted that quote in our chat and um yeah he said it's in the collective writings i haven't found it yet but i'm looking I'll look for collective writings i have a physical copy of it yeah yeah for sure. Anyway, on that note, um, should we wrap it up? Does anyone have anything they want to add? Um, no, nah, we, we could go into like other, other writings of futurism at a later date. Yeah, for sure. I think this was good, just like as yeah, an introduction of futurism. Uh, we went through the 11 points, talked about Salo for a bit, and Nietzsche and egoism. Um, yeah, this was a good uh, podcast, I think. I think we'll call it. Yeah, okay. It was pretty good. We went for the basics of futurist ideology, which is for later podcasts would be important to reference back to. Yeah, for sure. Anyway, uh, till next time, salute.